snap. The kick is in the air, and the kick this time is no, sir, Ree. No, sir, Ree. Final score, Tennessee 20, Florida 17. Pandemonium reigns. You're listening to the RTI Podcast, powered by Walking Tom Insider. Hello, everyone, and welcome in to another episode of the RTI Podcast. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, the managing editor of RocketTopInsider.com, and I am joined by Ben McKee, our staff writer here at RTI. We appreciate you guys tuning in for another episode of the podcast. It's been a little bit since Ben and I had done a podcast together, uh, but it's getting closer and closer to, well, maybe closer and closer to football time. Uh, here in the SEC, so we, we wanted to go ahead and we're going to try to get back into the swing of things and, and do a more consistent regular podcast. We'll, we'll still be doing uh, I'll still be doing a, the recruiting podcast as well, try to get that kind of more consistent as well, um, but obviously not a ton going on right now because all visits and stuff are uh, on hold during the current pandemic, and now we, got, we had news today uh, a little a few hours before we recorded this podcast that there's a report, I, I believe from AL.com is where I saw it first, was that uh, SEC media days later on in July are now being postponed and they don't really have a, a date set for when they're actually going to do that. So we'll we'll keep you all in touch and, and, and up to date with all that news and stuff. But hopefully then we will have uh, SEC football this season in some way, shape or form. And along that those vein there, I, I, I think a good conversation to have and, and one that it, it's kind of popped up a little bit here and there in this off season. But as of the recording this podcast, it'll be probably July, the 1st of July, when most of you guys are listening to this podcast. So we're, we're getting to that kind of last month of where typically there isn't really anything going on where you'd have SEC media days and then fall camps usually start in August. So we're getting into the, the kind of the last stretch here of the off season, typically, like I said, we'll see about this year. But I wanted to discuss Jarrett Garantano and where he ranks among the SEC quarterbacks heading into 2020. Now, this is a conversation we're having here in late June, early July. Uh, you know, we've talked before on, on this podcast multiple times, Ben. You know that we we're not guaranteeing. We, we don't necessarily think Garantano is even going to be the starter for all the whole season. We, we've talked at length about you know, will he be unseated? Will it be Harrison Bailey? Will it be Brian Maurer? Will will someone come in and you know will someone improve in, in the fall and the summer and stuff? And you know, if, if Garantano struggles early in the season, does he get pulled? So. Where we're ranking him doesn't. It's, we're basing it on projecting, of obviously, that he has a good enough season to be the starter all season, or just kind of where we think he is heading into this season compared to other SEC quarterbacks. And Ben, I, I've looked at a couple of different lists, you know, whether it's uh, two or seven sports, whether it's a couple other sites that I, I think right now I have one pulled up that's a Texas A&M uh, specific site that has the rankings uh, of all the quarterbacks here too. I've consistently seen Garantano listed somewhere in the bottom half of the conference in, in terms of the quarterbacks this season. Typically, you have uh, Kellen Mond and Kyle Trask and Jamie Newman as kind of your top three guys that are um, going to be in the SEC this year. Of course, Mond from A&M, Trask from Florida, Jamie Newman is the transfer uh, from Wake Forest, who's at Georgia. But then you have a, a, a very interesting mix kind of in the middle. I don't think a lot of people kind of know what to make of Mac Jones at Alabama. You have Bo Nix at Auburn, who showed potential as a freshman, but he's you know he's going to be a sophomore this year. KJ Costello, who transferred uh, from Stanford to Mississippi State, who's going to be in a you know a system with Mike Leach. You figured that would benefit him quite a bit. Uh, Ryan Helinski, who had a, a you know had some flashes as a freshman last year, but I think struggled more than uh, than not at South Carolina. Uh, Felipe Franks has transferred to Arkansas. You also have I, I can't remember. I think Arkansas is one of those those things that have. Um, one of those teams that have a, a just a, a any number of guys who can play at quarterback there. But you also have John Rice Plumley at, at Ole Miss, who's a very good uh, running quarterback, but passing is you know a little bit left to be desired. Miles Brendan, who has huge shoes to fill at LSU. Terry Wilson, who's coming off a, a season-ending injury last year at Kentucky. Sean Robinson, who is a TCU transfer who's playing at Missouri. And then Vanderbilt is another one of those teams that has uh, any number of options. I think they have. Uh, Goodness, I think they have like three different guys who can potentially play with uh, Jerry, Jeremy Musa, uh, Ken Seals, and Mike Wright. So you have, who knows what those? I, I think by consensus, by default, everyone's kind of putting Vanderbilt's 
uh, quarterbacks there at the bottom. But Ben, before I kind of share what I want to, it, it can be a straight 1 through 14 of where you want to rank. It can be kind of a tier system of here's the, the top tier, here's the B tier, here's the, the C tier. But in your opinion, where do you think Garantano kind of ranks among the SEC quarterbacks as we're getting ready for the 2020 football season? I have not sat down and ranked one through whatever yet in terms of ranking the SEC quarterbacks. Uh, so I will talk this out uh, for the sake of, of this topic on, on this podcast. I'll start in the SEC East where I believe Jared Garantano is the third or fourth best quarterback entering the season. I think Kyle Trask is the best returning quarterback in the East. I think Kyle Trask is the best returning uh, quarterback in the SEC in general, not only uh, the SEC. Um, you know, he ranked second in the league last year behind Joe Burrow uh, in, in multiple categories, uh, threw more touchdowns than Jake Fromm, uh, had fewer interceptions than Jamie Newman, had a better quarterback rating uh, than Jamie Newman. And I, I don't think he was a flash in the pan last year. I, I think he is a really talented quarterback who has just run into bad luck during his football career. In high school, he's behind Derek King, uh, who ended up signing with Houston and starring at Houston and then ultimately transferred to Miami this offseason. Uh, that was the guy in front of him in high school. That's why he did not start in high school, not because he was – a bad quarterback or whatnot, but just because his high school is loaded and then he gets to Florida and um, as a freshman, he did redshirt and then as a redshirt freshman, he was looking like he might win the job over Felipe Franks and then he breaks his ankle. Uh, and then his redshirt sophomore season, he played in four games uh, as a backup uh, as Felipe Franks kind of took a stranglehold on that job, but even if you go back to his redshirt sophomore year in which he played four games as a backup, I believe it was going into the Missouri game. Uh, Felipe was not playing well. Trask was doing his thing in practice, and, and he was about to get an opportunity to be the starting quarterback, and he suffered another injury. So um, he's run into a lot of bad luck, and then, you know, unfortunately for Felipe Franks, it was bad luck, but in terms of Kyle Trask's uh, playing time, it was good luck in the sense of Franks goes down with an injury, he steps in, and that Florida offense took a a huge step forward just based off of his leadership and, and his ability. He's not a, a flashy guy, but he, he just gets the job done. He does everything that Dan Mullen asks him to. Uh, he doesn't turn the football over a ton. Uh, he's very accurate. He, he's just productive, and he's a good leader. So I think he's the best returning quarterback in the SEC. And I say Jared Garantano is the third or fourth best quarterback in the SEC for this upcoming season, the SEC East, that is, uh, because I think you can make the case that both Jamie Newman and JT Daniels at Georgia uh, is better than Jared Garantano. Now, JT Daniels did struggle as a freshman. Obviously, this, this past season he redshirted because he tore his ACL. Uh, in the first game of the season. But as a true freshman in 2018, JT Daniels started 11 or 12 games, completed 59% of his passes, which is not great, uh, threw for 2,600 yards, and then 14 touchdowns and 10 interceptions, which 14 touchdowns is good as a freshman, 10 interceptions mm, expected as a freshman, but still not good. Uh, and, and he really showed some weaknesses with with mostly decision-making, uh, staring down receivers, not showing great pocket presence. So I do think you can make the case, although some Tennessee fans will will refuse to hear this sentence, I think you can make the case that Jared Gantano is, is better than JT Daniels because when JG has been good, um, he, he has been good with decision-making and he has been accurate. And that is something that JT Daniels has not proven he can do at this level. So because JT has a small sample size uh, and, and folks are, are still building him up based off of potential, and, and we've seen what JG can do against an Auburn, a great Auburn defense, a great Kentucky defense, back-to-back uh, -back years uh, against a great Kentucky defense. And, and there are other games. JG obviously hasn't won against Alabama or, or Florida or Georgia, really hasn't even played well in those games. But there are – good performances against those second and third tier teams in the SEC for JG. So 
Uh, because JT Daniels hasn't proven a lot, I'll go ahead and say that JG is the third best quarterback uh, in, in the SEC East behind Kyle Trask at Florida, behind Jamie Newman at Georgia. Uh, Jamie Newman is just so athletic, and he will have to definitely prove himself uh, in, in the sense of being able to transition to the to the SEC. But I definitely think he's more of a threat to defenses than Jared Garantano is. Uh, so I, I would go... I would go Trask, Newman, JG, uh, JT, Daniels, and that's you can hear the, the the pause in my in my voice. It's because I do think that Terry Wilson at Kentucky and Ryan Helinski are closer to JG and JT Daniels than most people would expect. Now there is a glaring concern. Uh, with Terry Wilson in terms of him coming off of a torn a torn patella in, in week two of last year and, and missed the entire season. And he's a great athlete, great runner. Uh, he's essentially another running back for Kentucky, but that season in which Kentucky broke out and won 10 games in 2018, he had a high completion percentage of 67.2%, but Kentucky didn't take many chances through the air. Hmm. Kentucky only threw – or Terry Wilson, that is, only threw for 200 yards on three different occasions, 145 passing yards uh, per game, which is not sexy whatsoever. I mean, he was 11 touchdowns, 8 interceptions, and 1,800 yards. So, yeah, he completed 67% of his passes, but Eddie Grant at Kentucky didn't call on him to use his, his arm as much as his legs. So I do think Terry Wilson is dangerous uh, and not far behind J.G., but because J.G., is more equipped to hurt defenses with his arm. Uh, I, I put him ahead of uh, Terry Wilson there at Kentucky. And then as for Ryan Holinsky at South Carolina, I, I do think there's a higher ceiling with Ryan Holinsky this season than there is with Jared Gantano. Ryan Holinsky has uh, all the talent in the world, but there was some disappointment uh, with Holinsky in, in South Carolina's football program uh, last year. Uh, he required a a cleanup of the knee after the season, and he did start 11 games, taking over in week two following a season injury, season ending injury to Jake Bentley. Uh, and he did deal with elbow and knee injuries, and he finished 11th in the SEC in passer rating and was last among regular starters in terms of yards per attempt at 5.8, only completed 58% of his passes, uh, 11 touchdowns to five interceptions, which is solid. Uh, as a true freshman, but um, he dealt with injuries last year. Uh, And South Carolina's offense as a whole dealt with injuries. So I still have high hopes for Ryan Holinsky. But J.G. has has proven himself more than Ryan Holinsky has to this this point. So, yes, Holinsky has uh, a higher ceiling, more potential. But I think Jared Gantano is in a better situation when you look at Tennessee's offensive line, when you look at Tennessee's receivers, when you look at Tennessee's running backs, when you look at Tennessee's offensive coaches. Uh, so that's why I have JG uh, in front of Halinski. And I know I'm long-winded here, but I'm, I'm t- talking this out. As you can see, so I'll finish out the SEC East, and then I'll let you give your thoughts. And if you want me to, I can give my thoughts on the SEC as a whole. But uh, And then Missouri and Vanderbilt, I mean, they don't – they don't have anybody. Like I, I feel sorry for for their fan bases. Uh, Missouri, uh, it's going to be either Sean Robinson, a, a transfer from TCU, who was able to redshirt uh, last season and, and become fully healthy, become fully healthy um, in seven games as a sophomore at TCU. He averaged 190 passing yards, had nine touchdowns, eight interceptions. So there's some potential there, especially to, to kind of fit that Jamie Newman, Kelly Bryant type dual threat role. Uh, so who knows what will happen there with Sean Robinson. And the other option is Connor Bazelak, a redshirt freshman who did look good in limited action last season for Missouri, uh, but he only attempted 21 passes and he left the final game of the season against Arkansas with a torn ACL. Now, um, he is expected to be back for preseason camp, and he was even able to do some drills in the first three spring practices. Um, but it's just such a small sample sample size for, for such a young guy. So I definitely think Tennessee's quarterback situation with Jarrett Garantano is better than Sean Robinson or, or Connor Bazelak. And then you look at Vanderbilt, and 
Oh my gosh! I mean, they have a, a JUCO transfer it, and, and two freshmen. That that's what they have. Yes, I mean, <laughs> yeah. That and, and it looks like the true freshman is kind of the favorite. Mike Wright, um, you know, they had four quarterbacks last year in 2019, and none of the four are coming back. So he was a priority for the on the recruiting trail for Vanderbilt, and he's the biggest running threat of that group. They have Danny Clark, a redshirt junior who was a one-time Ohio State commit. Spent two years at Kentucky, went to JUCO, um, did not play in his two seasons at Kentucky. He'll have two years of eligibility left, but who knows what they'll get from him. The Mike Wright, Mike Wright, the freshman that I just mentioned, who knows what they'll get from from him. And then they have Jeremy Musa, who you mentioned, um, played in two games as a freshman at Hawaii in 2018, but was four for nine. So you have three guys there, but that offense is not going to be good, especially up front. So how productive they'll be able to be. I highly doubt they'll be able to be productive. So I definitely like JG and Tennessee's quarterback situation uh, better than Vanderbilt. So uh, to quickly recap, and I'll let you kind of go over the SEC East, and then after you give a spiel, I can talk about the SEC West quarterbacks for a minute and kind of where JG ranks um, in total in the SEC. But I like Trask, then Jamie Newman, uh, then JG, then JT Daniels, then Terry Wilson, Ryan Helensky. Uh, we'll go Missouri's quarterbacks and then Vanderbilt's quarterbacks. I actually, I, I think I might leave it there at the SEC East. I think that's actually a, a pretty good breakdown. And, and uh, obviously, the, the East is what Vol fans will care the most about because Tennessee will will you'll play Alabama, they'll play uh, Arkansas this year. But Arkansas, uh, and you, know, I, I think what, before I kind of get my thing here, I, I was I was inspired by listening to you kind of break this down, Ben. I think there are clear kind of tiers that most people would put the SEC quarterbacks into right now in the preseason. I think you have a, a clear tier one with Trask, Newman, Mond, and, and probably Costello, and, and, and probably Bo Nix, I would put him in there. I, th- I think, to me, maybe Costello and Mac Jones are, are two guys that I, I, I think have the talent. It's just a matter of, you know, with Costello, I think he'll have a, a chance to be, you know, have a pretty decent season stat-wise because of the offense he's going to be in with Mike Leach. And Mac Jones is, uh, he, he's very talented, but I don't know that he's, you know, he's not guaranteed, just like with Garantan, he's not guaranteed to keep that job all season. He's going to have, um, what, I guess Bryce Young behind him. He's going to have a, a couple of, you know, highly rated guys behind him um, on the depth chart. So he's not even guaranteed to be the starter for all season, just like we've talked about with Garantano. But Ben, you were, when you were breaking down the quarterbacks there, I got inspired to ask this question, um, and I'll, I'll answer it too after you answer it. But given these options... Who would you choose for Tennessee's roster? I, mean, I guess just or just a t- as a team in general, it doesn't have to be Tennessee, but if you were a coach and you had your choice of these specific quarterbacks, who would you choose? If you had to choose between Jerry Garantano for for the 2020 season, if you had just one season with them, would it be Garant- Garantano, Ryan Helensky, Felipe Franks, Terry Wilson, or John Rice Plumley? Of those quarterbacks, who would you choose to lead your team, whether it's Tennessee or whatever, for the 2020 season? So Ryan Helensky, Terry Wilson, John Reese Plumley, or Felipe Franks, and Garantano, yeah, and Garantano. Oh, that's a that's a. <laughs> Sorry, I put you on the spot. I know we didn't talk about that before we did yeah. the uh, the pre show. No, stuff, it's all but... good. It, it's all it's all good. Um, I'm not taking Felipe Franks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not. See, this is where it gets tough because each quarterback has glaring issues. Um, maybe glaring is too strong of a word for a guy like John Reese Plumley. Reese Plumley is just young, and he, he's just young in the sense of being a passer. He's a heck of an athlete. I mean, he runs a four four second forty as a as a quarterback, and according to Pro Football Focus, uh, he averaged seven point five yards per designed rush attempt, which was the highest among returning Power Five quarterbacks with at least 60 such attempts last year, and that was by a good margin. And he broke a ton of tackles on those runs, um, but he threw for 910 yards, four touchdowns, and three interceptions. He ran for 1,020 yards, 6.6 yards per carry. That's great for a running back. Um, But I would not take Plumlee because he is uh, one-dimensional and against Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Oklahoma. I'll even throw Kentucky in there. Uh, Will Muschamp at South Carolina. They are going to key in on the run, and they are going to force him to beat them 
with his arm. So uh, because he is such a, a one-dimensional player right now, I do think I think you can make the case that he has the highest potential out of the five options that you gave me, him or Ryan Helensky. But I'm, I'm going to need him to to prove it with his arm before I am willing to to take him out of that group. And I think Ryan Helensky is also going to fall into that category for me as well. Again, I, I do think most of his struggles last year were because of the elbow and knee injuries that he dealt with. Uh, but I'm, I'm in the same boat with Ryan Helensky that, it, that I am with John Reese Plumley, And that is that you just have to, to prove it to me. And honestly, I think Ryan Helensky would be set up for more success in Tennessee's offense than South Carolina's offense because he, he, Really, injuries was the thing that really kept him down. He he made good decisions. Uh, he could have been a little bit more accurate with the football. He only completed 58% of his passes. But again, he was dealing with an elbow and knee injury, which directly affects your ability to throw the football. So assuming that he is healthy, I think he's going to have a good year. But then you look at South Carolina's offense and their running game has been terrible over the years under Will Muschamp, and they lose their top three running backs from last season. Uh, they lose uh, Brian Edwards to the NFL, really their only good receiver last year, so they don't have any proven weapons at wide receiver or tight end. And, you know, their offensive line has a draft prospect in Sedarius Hutchinson at left guard and Dylan, Dylan Wanham at right tackle. But, you know, th- there's been a – Tennessee's offensive line is better. So oh, yeah. uh, I do think Ryan Helensky would be better suited for Tennessee's offense um, than his, his own offense. But he's still young. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bank on Jarrett Garantano's and Terry Wilson's experience over Helensky and Plumlee. And I just don't trust uh, Felipe Franks right now. I, I think he's too emotional. I think he's too sporadic with the football. So – to answer your question, it's Jarrett Garantano or Terry Wilson, and I know it's going to sound crazy, but I'm going with Jarrett Garantano because Terry Wilson is one-dimensional as well. Again, he completed 67% of his passes in 2018 when he was in his first year as a starting quarterback, but they didn't throw the football. He only threw for 200 yards or more on three different occasions. Yes, Jarrett Garantano has struggled, but I still think there's untapped potential there. I think he has um, you know, the arm talent to play in the NFL, that does not mean he is going to play in the NFL, but I mean, he has the arm talent. That has never been the problem. It's always been between the ears for JG, and I think a second year under Jim Chaney is really going to help him with that. So, I know it sounds crazy to, to some, but also remember the quarterbacks that you, you gave me, Nathaniel, <laughs> as my <laughs> options. Uh, I like Terry Wilson's athletic ability, but I think JG is a more complete quarterback, and I think there's a higher ceiling with JG that has not been tapped than there is with with Terry Wilson right now. So I'd go Jared Gantano out of those options. I yeah. I, I, to be clear, there I, I put gave you kind of the options, and the, to me, the clear tier two, tier three category quarterbacks. I, I think tier one. As I said, is Mon Trask probably Newman, and you could throw in Knicks in there, and then I think Costello and Jones are kind of maybe their own tier of, of. There's a lot of potential there. Just don't really know exactly what to expect from them. But I think those those four or five quarterbacks I listed off to you, I think those are they're to me their own kind of tier and, and ones that can move up to another tier just depending on how their seasons go and how the team plays this year. But I'm I'm with you for the most part there. I think of that group. JG might be the one I pick. The the only one I, I, I hesitate because, like you said, I, I like Holinsky's upside. I, I like the things he did before he got hurt, but the injuries really hurt him. And if we're, if we're switching him out into Tennessee's offense as opposed to South Carolina's offense, I think he could be a, a much better quarterback with you know not only Jim Chaney as OC, but as the thing you listed out with Tennessee's offensive line, with the the young but promising receiving group that Tennessee has, with the running back core Tennessee has. I think Tennessee is just a much, much better team than South Carolina. And, and while Tennessee's schedule is also very difficult, South Carolina has one of the, the most difficult schedules in all of college football this upcoming season. Uh, so he's not going to have any favors done for him with, a, like you said, a, an offense that has to replace a lot from last year. It doesn't have a, a ton of weapons there. And they're going to be facing, a you know again, a, a very, very just awful, just difficult schedule for them this season. I, it's, to me, it's between Garantano and Helensky. I, I get what you're saying about Wilson. I I think he is 
I think Jason Swain on on this one event the show that you help um, produce and co-host. He made a good point um, on Tuesday morning's show talking about with Wilson being out with him having the knee injury he had last year. He's probably had a chance to work on, you know, to improve his arm strength, to improve his his throwing ability because he's not going to, he, you know, he hasn't been able to use his legs as much in the off season as he's recovering from that injury. So he's had to maybe, maybe, you know, rely more on his passing and, and hone that more. And this upcoming season, he may not be able to rely on his legs as much as he did, you know, back in 2018. But I also wonder with Wilson, you look at that that quarterback situation in Kentucky, you have Joey Gatewood there, who I, I believe is eligible for this upcoming season. That's another situation where, like with Garantano, like with Mac Jones, like with uh, technically even John Rice Plumley, you have Matt Corral there, who could be a, a, a passing quarterback. Uh, there are multiple I guess multiple teams this year in the SEC East and West both that have very intriguing quarterback battles. You know, I, I think Jamie Newman will win out the job there at Georgia, but as you mentioned, there's JT Daniels there as well, who, who assuming he's eligible for the season, um, I, he's going to fight for that that job. I, I I don't doubt that one bit. So you have a lot of different options um, across the board at different SEC schools. So this is just kind of projected starters as of right now, without you know, with there being a very shortened spring practice session with some workouts kind of getting started later and it's still being a little bit limited in what they can do with fall camp, you know, being a big question mark. I would, I would, I think I would choose Garantano there, but Helensky to me is, is very intriguing. And it's, if he's healthy um, and if he's in Tennessee's offense, I, I like his potential a lot more than what he would be doing at South Carolina. Yeah, I think, no, I, I completely agree with that. And honestly, I would, I would probably take Ryan Helensky over Terry Wilson in the order of the the quarterbacks that you gave me I'd probably go JG then Helensky then Terry Wilson then John Reese Plumley, and then Felipe Franks um and honestly I think Ryan Helensky uh, is, is kind of what Harrison Bailey is going to be in, in terms of setting himself up or let me let me rephrase that I think if you took Ryan Helensky, a healthy Ryan Helensky, and you put him in Tennessee's offense with Jim Chaney, with T. Martin, with Chris Winkie behind arguably the, the best offensive line in the SEC, um, you know, with two running backs in Eric Gray and Ty Chandler, who will get the job done behind an outstanding offensive line. And then you, you look at tight end and yeah that's going to be a weakness but you don't necessarily need a tight end to be successful especially when you have Josh Palmer I think D'Angelo Gibbs by the end of the season could prove to be better than Josh Palmer you have Brandon Johnson who has been productive at times during his career and then you have several freshmen stepping foot on campus who are already flashing their potential in in workouts as they are back on campus so I think if you put Ryan Helensky, a healthy Ryan Helensky as a sophomore into this Tennessee offense this season, I think that's a snapshot of what Tennessee fans have to look forward to in Harrison Bailey. Somebody who, you know, obviously they're not going to be running around like Terry Wilson or John Reese Plumley, but they're going to get the job done with their arm, making fairly good decisions, uh, and they're surrounded by a lot of good pieces. So, I don't know why, but when you were speaking there, that kind of struck me that I think if you put Ryan Helensky in, in this offense this year, I think that's a snapshot of what Tennessee fans have to look forward to uh, in the future with Harrison Bailey. And I say that with I still having a lot of hope in Ryan Helensky. Like I, I know people are kind of down on him after he struggled last year, but I, I am chalking it up to, to being a true freshman, being – behind a, a poor offensive line against a brutal schedule uh, and not having a ton of weapons around him, uh, injuries, freshmen. So I, I can I can see Ryan Helensky and, and Harrison Bailey being very similar uh, style quarterbacks. I think that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that, but I, I, I think you could be right. And, and with Helensky, we've talked about his injury. He, he left the, the upset win against Georgia early, um, and then it came out after the season in December, I think early December, um, South Carolina announced that he's going to have to have, he ended up having to have um, arthroscopic surgery to repair a, a small tear of a, his meniscus in his left knee. So, I mean, that's a pretty, that's a pretty bad injury. And, and he was playing with that injury against Clemson. And he, I mean, he's, he'd been beat up um, 
most of the season. He, he had the first half of the year where he was you know healthy and okay, but then after that Georgia game, it, you could tell he was clearly not the same, and, and they weren't trusting him to you know they were asking him to do as much in the offense. He still had a you know a decent season, especially for a freshman um, who got thrown into the fire with Bentley, like you said, going down for the year early on. But um, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting comparison between him and Harrison Bailey, and I think that's that'll be interesting to see. As long as you know, this is all assuming again that Hilinski is healthy. If he's healthy, I, I love his ceiling and, and like what he can do. But I don't think I've actually ranked the quarterbacks in the SEC, so I, I, I'll, I'll kind of go in your your line there. I think with the SEC East, I think Trask to me is the clear number one. Um, I, I don't think you can. You're going to have Georgia fans and some other people argue Jamie Newman. I got to see it before I believe it with him. I, I think he had obviously a, a pretty good career at Wake Forest, especially a, a good season last year. Um, but that's playing against the ACC defenses he played against and playing against the SEC defenses he's going to play this year are, are two totally different ball games. I think he's going to be good. I have him number two. Um, but I, I think to me, in my opinion, Trask is the clear number one. And I, I agree with you, Ben. I think I would put Garantano at number three. And then I think you have uh, Helinski and Wilson Probably is a, a 4A, 4B, just depending, again, on, on the, the health of either one of those kids. Um, and then Missouri and then Vanderbilt, because <laughs> I don't think Vanderbilt... I, I think Mike Wright, Wright for Vanderbilt could be good down the line, but he's going to be a, a, a true freshman. I think he's one that could win the job. Um, you know, He's rated pretty decently coming out of high school. He's very athletic, but like you said, man, no quarterback. If, if Peyton Manning was in that offense, he would not be set up to succeed. But that, that offense does not look good. Um, heading into this season. So I, I think I, for the top three, at least, I, I agree with you uh, completely on the SEC East quarterbacks. And like I said, I don't, I don't think it's necessary for us to go through the West. And, and compare I do all have... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I, won't, I won't go on a long spill like I did about the SEC East quarterbacks, but I, but I have determined where I think JG ranks amongst all SEC quarterbacks heading okay. into the season. And I have him slotted at eight. Um, and I think that that is a fair ranking A because I think the the crop of SEC quarterbacks is better this year than it has been over the, the last two or three years. Um, it's not as top-heavy. Uh, you don't have your Tua Tungavailoa. You don't have your your Joe Burrow, your Jake Fromm. You know, you don't have those guys. But from top to bottom, I think it is it is stronger. There's really only – two quarterback rooms in the entire SEC that I don't like, and that's Missouri and Vanderbilt. I, I just kind of crapped on Felipe Franks, but I do think Felipe Franks has potential. I mean, he has a heck of an arm. After all, he was drafted by the Boston Red Sox in the Major League Baseball draft last year, and Felipe Franks is very similar to Jared Garantano in the sense of it's just all between the ears uh, for him, and if, if the right coordinator can just get it to click for him in his head I, I do think there is potential and you look at Arkansas's wide receiver room and it, it's a strong young wide receiver room with Mike Woods he'll be a junior this year Trey Knox a former mm -hmm. Tennessee recruit that Tennessee didn't really pursue maybe as much as they should have but he was uh, really good as a freshman and then Traylon Burks is kind of the star of that wide receiver room he was all SEC freshman last year so they have a good trio of receivers they have Rakeem Boyd who you can make the, the argument that he's the best returning running back in the SEC. So he does have some weapons there, just not a great offensive line in, in front of him. So really the only quarterback rooms I don't like are Missouri's and Vanderbilt. So I think J.G. being eighth in my personal rankings is acknowledging that, yes, Jarrett Gantano needs to improve off off of his uh, weaknesses from, from last year. And, you know, that's – uh, better decision making, um, showing better accuracy, being um, better as a play action passer. So I think that acknowledges his weaknesses, uh, but also acknowledges his strengths and acknowledges that the the crop from top to bottom is is stronger than it has been in the last two or three three seasons. I think Mac Jones, Miles Brennan, uh, Kellen Mond. I think they're all better than Jerry Garantano. I would take Bo Nix at Auburn over Jared yeah. Garantano, although I do need to see uh, Bo Nix shine as a as a passer more than a runner, and he did flash towards the end of Auburn's season last year, uh, showed uh, a lot of improvement, and I think you'll continue to see that with Chad Morris 
as the offensive coordinator. And then I think KJ Costella at Mississippi State, I think he's going to have a have a good season. Uh, with Mike Leach as his head coach. I mean, it's it's really as simple as that. K.J. Costello is already talented, and now you pair him uh, at Mississippi State with Mike Leach and, and Kylan Hill in that backfield and a couple of solid receivers, and I I, I think he's really good. I, I would love to have seen him transfer to Tennessee. I think he would be good in Tennessee's offense as well. So um, I, I put J.G. eighth, and that's of, of the guys that we have seen play college football. Um, because you look at Bryce Young at Alabama, he's probably, not probably, he is more talented than Jerry Garantano. But we have not seen him in an SEC football game, so I uh, want to see it from him. But I, I would say Jerry Garantano is, has been fairly ranked in those rankings that you alluded to uh, to start the podcast. Most of them have had him uh, seventh to tenth. Uh, most of them, there have been some where he is lower than tenth, but uh, I, I have him eighth going into the season. Yeah, I think eighth or, or seventh would be where I put him. But to me, he's squarely right there at the, at the very top of the bottom half, or at the very bottom of the top half. You know, I, I'm not willing to really put him any higher than that. I don't, I don't think he really needs to be much lower. I, I think ninth would be the absolute lowest I'd put him. But I, I agree with you. I, I would take, you know, Trask Newman. I would take Helen Mond. Uh, I would take Alabama's quarterback room, period. I don't care who it is. I would take them over um, over Garantano. Uh, I'd take KJ Costello over Garantano. And then I, I can't remember if I said it, but Bo Nix, I would take over him too. Miles Brennan, I, the ones that I, I, you know, I think you could kind of swap in and out with, with JG and it makes sense would be, you know, a Miles Brennan or a, a Felipe Franks or Ryan Holinsky. But I, I personally would take Garantano over Franks. And I think that would put him to me at least eighth. It kind of depends on, on, you know, Kalinsky and then what you know how good Miles Brennan is going to be. He's he's got the potential to be really good. It just you know especially with, with LSU the talent they have there. Although they they did obviously lose a ton from this past season as well. But I think eighth seventh somewhere around there is is appropriate. Like I said, the the very top part of the bottom of the conference or the very bottom part of the top of the conference is to me right where JG is entering this season. He he can move up. He could definitely move down. Uh, but that's kind of where I see it. I think it's you know. We both kind of agree there. He's right in the middle of the SEC and heading in, heading into the season, and he has the potential to be a lot better, or he has the potential to lose his job by you know week four. So we'll, we'll, we're gonna see what happens with JG this year. Uh, he has the offensive line to help him out. He has the weapons around him to help him out. He has the second year of you know being in Jim Chay's offense to help him out. So he's got a lot of things going for him. It's just a matter of like you said, it's gotta be you know between the ears. Can he? Can he? make the right decisions can he you know he does pretty good under pressure it's just does he you know can he call the right plays can he do the right thing when it's when it's matters most for him in games really quickly here ben to kind of close up the podcast wanted to talk a little bit of men's basketball as well um you and swain had a, a, a i thought it was a good conversation i wanted to kind of touch on it you know the same topic here on the rti podcast and that is with eve ponds and you know we We've talked about him before on the podcast, I believe. I know you and I have talked about him before in the mailbag and, and you know off air and stuff too. But it was believed when he you know declared for the NBA draft um, back when he did. I think it was in May, maybe late April. I don't remember exactly when he did it now, but uh, whenever he declared for the NBA draft, it was assumed you know by me, by by most of all fans, by a, a lot of people in general that he was you know doing the same thing that Admiral Schofield did a couple years ago where he, he declared and, and put his name in the, the draft pool and got a lot of feedback from scouts and NBA and, you know, guys in the NBA and stuff and then came back for his senior season and withdrew his name, you know, before the um, withdrawal date came up. I, I think a lot of us assumed Pons was going to do the same thing, and he may still. You know, I, I, I still think the odds are more in favor of him doing that, but there's a growing sentiment out there that that may not be the case, and whether that's him staying in the draft whether that's him trying to, you know, stay in the draft and then maybe taking a chance in the G League, doing what Jordan Bone did and either getting drafted late in the second round or, you know, maybe going the Kyle Alexander route and, uh, you know, signing for a summer league deal. Well, whatever that's going to be this year, I guess. Uh, but, signing, you know, signing on with a, a team and, and, you know, going through the G League and stuff or with him being, you know, an international prospect as it is, maybe him going back to France or, or going overseas somewhere for a year and then, you know, playing over there for a year or two and then trying to, you know, take what he learned from the international game into the NBA. 
I, I think there's a there's a lot of avenues for Eve Pons. I want to talk about two things really quickly here. One, what do you think ends up happening with Pons? And two, if he does, you know, if he does not come back for a senior season, whether it's him going to the NBA or uh, going overseas, what does that mean for Tennessee? To me, I I still think. I, th- I think it's maybe closer to the 50-50 than I, I would have thought, you know, two, three weeks ago. I still think he comes back for a senior season, but I, I am not, you know, I'm not going to bet on that at this point. It, I, I don't feel, I don't feel like I did with Jordan Bone, where I, I felt like Jordan Bone pretty early on in that process that he was probably going to stay in from, you heard more and more things from uh, different people talking about, you know, he, he seems like he wants to go ahead and go pro and, and you know, make the money when he can. And I, I, don't, I wouldn't blame Pons for that. He has a family. He has, I believe he has a wife already. Um, he, he's in a very different situation than a lot of student athletes. Uh, again, being an international prospect as well. Wouldn't blame him at all for going out and, and wanting to make some money out now after the you know the, the breakout season he had this past year. I'm still going to lean that he comes back to Tennessee, but I, to me it's like a 60-40 at best. I'm, I'm feeling more like a, a 55-45 in that, that, that kind of lane. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, Ben, do you think he comes back or do you think he – stays in the draft or, or goes overseas? I do think he ultimately comes back. Uh, and I don't have a great feel for the situation. I just don't think there's enough evidence yet that would point to him not returning to school. So I'm still expecting him to return to school. I, I don't feel great because I think that you could make a great case for him to to not return uh, I, I know it comes as a surprise to, to many Tennessee fans, um, but I, I think he's had a legitimate decision to make all along. And th- that's because he is an athletic freak. He is good defensively in in multiple ways. Sure, he needs to improve a lot on the offensive end, but he is a tenacious worker. Um, and, and Justin the past three years we have seen him improve each and every single season so he'll never be a 12 15 points per game guy at the nba level and and probably not overseas um but uh he is he has the makings of a solid jump shot he can knock it down when he is open he has a beautiful you know turnaround fade in, in the post and obviously he's a great dunker and uh, if he can continue to improve as a rebounder, both on the offensive glass and on the defensive glass, he can generate some some more offense there as well on the offensive glass. So uh, I, I think he's absolutely worthy of an NBA draft pick. I have seen far less talents be drafted late in the second round. Um, if Jordan Bone can be drafted late in the second round, E. Pons can be drafted late in, in the second round because I think Eve Pons has traits to his game that translates to the NBA just like Jordan Bone does. Uh, And and even if he isn't drafted, Eve Pons can go ahead and and go overseas and and make money doing that Uh, and then try to jump to the NBA after this season. And, you know, we may not have a college basketball season (laughs) this this year. (sighs) So if you're Eve Pons, why not just go ahead and decide to go play overseas? If Tennessee plays, Okay, but if they don't play, then the, then the decision will look genius because he'll be playing likely overseas and he'll be making money, and then you know that can serve as another year he enters the NBA draft and he probably gets drafted. So um, there's there's still not enough evidence to, to fully come out and say that yeah he's gone. Uh, so I lean towards he still returns just because. You know, he will benefit from improving on those areas of his game that that I just mentioned. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with it, and it would leave Tennessee in a really unfortunate situation. Just, and it's not E. Pons' fault whatsoever. Right. It's just uh, a byproduct of how crazy this year has been, and a byproduct of you know the funky schedule because of how crazy this year has been but if if it's the end of the july and he makes that decision to leave tennessee doesn't have time to go out and and find an adequate replacement and yes you have ej and a um but and he's going to play a ton as it is and and he'll play even more minutes but you know with eve ponds ej and and john fulkerson you don't have to have urosh plavchik and Olivier Camwall 
and Corey Walker Jr., the incoming freshman, you don't have to have those guys have an impact this season. But if Eve Pons declares and doesn't come back for his senior season, all of a sudden you need one of those three, Corey Walker, Urosh, or Olivia Kamwa, you need one of those three to step up and play productive minutes. And, and I don't know how comfortable this coaching staff <laughs> feels about needing that to happen because as a fan and as an observer of Tennessee basketball, I sure as heck don't feel comfortable with Urosh or Olivier playing key minutes. And Corey Walker may prove to be as good as Grant Williams as a freshman. I don't know. Um, but still, you don't want to have to rely on a freshman to play key minutes. So uh, I, I do think Eve comes back, don't feel great about it, and it would put Tennessee in a really, really bad situation uh, if, if he does declare because they just won't have time to go uh, fill his shoes, and that would be a really big blow to Tennessee. Yeah, I, I'm glad you touched on that. That was my, my follow-up question. Obviously, it was going to be if he does go, you know, what does Tennessee do? Is it as simple as you know plugging in EJ Anisiki into his spot? I think offensively that could work, and size-wise that could work because Anisiki is, you know, he's built like an Avril Schofield. He's built like an Epons, where he's this six seven, you know, two hundred forty-five pound type of guy who's a, a big bruiser. But he do, he's, he's not athletically, he's not what Eve Pons is. Defensively, he's definitely not what Eve Pons is. Uh, I know you're a big believer in Pons defensively as more than just a blocker, but as a guy who can cover, you know, one through four, potentially even one through five at the collegiate level of, of you know, he can guard guards, he can guard posts, he can guard centers because of his athleticism. And it's like he doesn't do that. He, he's, he's more, you know, he's not bad defensively. He's just not the same kind of versatility and, and same athleticism that Pons has, and I, I think if Pons does go, I, I think you're you're 100 percent right about that being Camwa or or Plashik or Walker having to step in and you know play more minutes than initially intended. But I also think maybe it's a again this this season for Tennessee would be kind of similar to what we saw a lot of last season, and that would be Tennessee maybe play more small ball with the fact that you have you know Josiah James who's you know not necessarily small he's six six so he's he's kind of that point forward type of guy. You, you have him, you have Escobie coming back, you have Jaden Springer and Keon Johnson as guards coming back, you have um, oh goodness, I just forget his name, uh, the, the transfer, Victor Bailey Jr. from Oregon, who's a guard as well. Tennessee's, their strength this year is going to be, even if Ponk does come back, to me, their strength this year is going to be at guard, or, or you know, guard slash whatever you want to classify um, James as, as kind of a, a guard forward type player. Even even with Pons coming back, if he does, you have him and Fulkerson and, and EJ Anisiki as your forwards this upcoming season. To me, Tennessee's strength is in the backcourt with those five stars and with Viscovi uh, having another year under his belt or having really a full off season under his belt and, and being able to you know really learn the offense, get more accustomed to life as a, a United States citizen, although right now he's currently not United States. He and uh, Plashvik are currently overseas, but still, in, in theory, you know, he's a, he's another year in the system, um, another year being taught by Rick Barnes, being taught by Kim English, being taught by that staff. I think, regardless of what happens with Pons, that backcourt is going to be Tennessee's strength. But I, I think if Pons does go, I think you're right about one of those those post players needing to step up and, and having to play a, a more significant role. But I also think that frees up more minutes to you can play more with Victor Bailey. You can you can have more minutes to give to Springer, to Johnson, to um, to Josiah James, and to Viscovia, and, and that frees them up a little bit more. It's going to hurt Tennessee, you know, maybe in the post a little bit more to not have pawns there, and defensively it might hurt Tennessee some. Man, I, I've I've seen Keon Johnson play, and I, I've you know talked to Mark Griffin who coached him in AAU ball. I've, I've talked to different people who've, who've coached him and seen him play. That kid is really, really, really good defensively. He's going to be good offensively, I think, too. He is stout on defense as you know, as an incoming freshman. James last year, despite his injuries and some of his struggles on offense, he was always a good defender last year as well. That's one reason why he stayed on, on the court as much as he did, even with his offensive struggles and his injuries, um, is because he was such a good defender. I think even if Pons doesn't come back, Tennessee will be okay. Uh, they'll be fine. I, th I think that kind of maybe knocks them down a little bit more of a peg. You know, instead of being a, a you know, potentially a top 10 kind of preseason team, they'll be, a, I think, top 20, maybe borderline top 15. I still think this team, even without Pons, is a, a team that can make a run to an Elite Eight, maybe a Final Four, depending on health and, and how these freshmen, you know, how they pan out and how they, they transition into the college game. But I'm a, a big believer in both Springer and Johnson. I think Walker has a high ceiling. I, I don't think that he's as polished as those two. And 
isn't as ready to be as a, a big of an immediate contributor as those other two. But um, I think Ben, even if Pons doesn't come back this season, which like you said, it, I don't feel great about saying he is, but I think I think he will. But the more time goes by, the less certain I feel about that. But even if he doesn't, I think Tennessee's team this year will still be top two, three uh, in the SEC. Yeah, I, I I think right now they are the best team in the SEC returning with Eve Ponds. And yeah. Kentucky has more natural talent. Uh, Cal is, is bringing in another ridiculous uh, recruiting class. And this one is probably his best in, in quite some time. Um, lately, he's had one or two mainly one really good freshman that comes in and then the other highly tatted guys have ended up having to to stay uh longer than they probably anticipated while they were being recruited but uh, i think this is going to be the year where you see two or three uh, kentucky freshmen uh, bj boston the number four overall player in the country terrence clark the number seven overall player in the country uh, you have Devin Askew, who is a big-time point guard, and they have picked up Olivier Saar from Wake Forest to transfer, and uh, Jacob Toppin to transfer from Rhode Island. And, um, you know, they, they have a lot of talent. They just don't have a lot of experience playing together. So I think you can make the case that Kentucky has more talent than Tennessee, but Tennessee is the better basketball team, and Kentucky just doesn't have a, a ton of, of more talent than, than Tennessee. Tennessee has plenty of talent. Uh, so right now with Eve Ponds, I, I think they're the best team in the SEC, but without Eve Ponds, they're still a really good basketball team um, capable of making a run to the Sweet 16. But I agree with you. I think with Eve Ponds, they're, they're a national championship caliber team, especially Final Four and Elite Eight. Without him, that the ceiling is, is probably, you know, Elite Eight. Sweet 16. I, I I truly think you need him as a rim protector. I know he's not a, a yeah. center, but uh, and John Fulkerson is a good defensive player. EJ Anasicki is, is a good defensive player, but they're not rim protectors like Eve Pons is. Um, so without him, you know, LSU probably better, uh, depending on a, a couple of guys they're waiting to hear back from. Uh, Trenton Watford, Darius Days, if they are going to stay in the NBA draft. Arkansas is going to be strong this year. South Carolina is going to be strong this year. Kentucky, obviously. I think Alabama is going to be sneaky good. I think Florida is going to be good. Ole Miss is going to be good. Uh, Vanderbilt will be better. Um, A&M will be better. Auburn will be good. It'll be another strong, strong year for the league. But um, Tennessee, in, in my opinion, is the clear-cut favorite with Eve Ponds. Without them, they're, like you said, top two, top three, top four. Still a really good team, just not the, the, the favorite in my eyes. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. And that's also not to, you know, we've mentioned some names here of guys who step up. That's also not to, you know, discount what potentially the steps that a guy like a Devontae Gaines or a Drew Pember could take. But I think Pember, to me, he, he, he's lost even more weight than he had last year, apparently, according to Tennessee's roster update from last season to this season. So he might be looking more as a that stretch four type of guy where he's not going to bang around in the paint. He wasn't already that kind of guy last year, but um, you know, you obviously have Gaines and Pember as two guys that we have not mentioned um, who who could you know play some more minutes and take a little bit bigger of, of roles this year than um, if, if Pons has not returned. But you know that's that's going to be interesting to kind of see what happens, and I think that'll be where we go ahead and in this podcast. And, and Ben, thank you for joining me for the podcast today and I appreciate all of you who tuned in and listened. It was a little bit long but it's been a while since we've done one and there's a lot to kind of talk about with uh, Garantano and I wanted to touch on the Eve Pond stuff because I, I think that is a, a good conversation to have as well. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, give us your thoughts. Where would you rank Garantano in, among SEC quarterbacks? Would you take him over the guys I mentioned to Ben uh, of the Ryan Helensky, John Rice Plumley, Felipe Franks and Terry Wilson, would you take Garantano over those guys or would you take another one uh, of those quarterbacks to start for Tennessee this upcoming season? And in your opinion, um, what do you think happens with Eve Pons? And if he doesn't come back, what do you think that means for Tennessee? Signing off for Ben, I am Nathaniel. Thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been another episode of the RTI Podcast.